I found myself very much emotionally touched, very much uh, feeling heartbroken for the couple. The couple was very active in the church. I was an associate pastor as my role that had only been there for six months. Logically, this is probably a couple that I would have known super well. And so them losing their child would feel like me losing a spiritual child. That heartbreak, that pain is a pain that I felt, felt very, very real in the moment. And after all this is done, I still knew it was a scenario, but at the same time still felt the, the feelings were real. <laughs> the feelings were real. The Good Shepherd knows his sheep, knows his flock. And I really think a seminary for where the church is today and moving forward is the school of the Good Shepherd. A more innovative piece that we're bringing into the seminary is something that we've evolved from what's going on in many medical schools. The simulation center came about to make sure that we could engage students in near real experiences where they were free to make mistakes. And so now, fast forward many years later, it's not just sort of um, a set of exercises, but it's a regular part of their training from the first day to when they graduate and then beyond. When Father John Carchi and I went for a visit out to Roslyn Franklin, we were both super intrigued and we thought, I wonder if this would work for a seminary. Now to see it actually work and make a difference that they're going to carry into the lives of their parishioners, that's exactly what we're looking for. You, know, you walk in, you know it's an artificial exercise, but very quickly, if the environment feels real, if the exercise feels real, you behave and you perform the way you really would. I like to go back to a document that really was seminal for seminary formation. Uh, and that was the vision of Pope St. John Paul II. Uh, he had a document, some of our viewers may be aware of, Pastores Double Vobis. There's a quality that he highlighted in that document, and it's a phrase called affective maturity. Helping a man grow in affective maturity means helping him both recognize what's going on inside of his heart, being able to read his emotions and feelings, and that doesn't come naturally to people, particularly in our culture today. So that's a skill that can be enhanced and honed. But then the maturity piece is, how do you integrate that in a healthy way so you're not ambushed by your anger, so you're not shut down by your fear or embarrassment? If you can keep that properly in control, that then allows you to access all the other skills that you've amassed in your, your pastoral training or drawing on the riches of the theological tradition. So there's a, a pedagogical way, there's a way to teach to help a man grow in that. It's a great method because it allows learners to practice those skills, those uncomfortable conversations that maybe they have never had before, in a way that's safe for them to learn. Even a seasoned professional that maybe has done it time and time again still gets sort of uncertain about it. Imagine what that must be like for a learner the first time through, right? In the beginning, for the new seminarian, it's just getting him used to noticing, oh my gosh, you know, they said this thing and all these feelings came up inside of me. Maybe a man uh, is the child of parents who are divorced and now he's working in a simulated, with a simulated couple, you know, whose marriage is falling apart. Well, all kinds of things, of course, will come up for him just at a personal level. Uh, and if a man does not begin to know how to read himself and understand that, uh, then anything he tries to convey, you know, is going to be sabotaged and is going to suffer. This helps take that anxiety away, practice those skills, and then build confidence, right? Because that parishioner on the other end of that conversation needs them to have those skill sets. We study about it all the time in class from a very practical level, but to have two people in front of you who are in tears because their son just died, at least for me, it reminds me, okay, this is about relationship, not only with the people in front of me, but their relationship to Christ and with Christ. Then we can help that man unpack everything that's going on. And now we can take what he's already learned about, well, here's what the church says about this, or here's what you might think about uh, as a way to try and seek some healing there. 
Now all that has a much richer context because the man isn't just reading it on a page or hearing it in a lecture. That realism actually made me think through how do I minister to this person in this situation? It's not just about what does the church teach, but how do I bring this church teaching to the person? This particular methodology inserts emotion into the learning process. And because emotion is part of pastoral encounters, the only way to really practice a pastoral encounter is to practice it in a holistic way. This provides a unique opportunity for them to become aware of their emotions in a pastoral situation, processing that with trained faculty, ready to, to help explore those areas with them in a low-risk environment, and then help them, you know, if they need to process that further with their formation advisors, with their counselors, so that they can be the most whole and most integrated man when they go out and they encounter that experience later on. In real life, you're not gonna have someone next to you seeing or listening to what you are saying. To be able to experience this here, it just kind of gave me that opportunity to hear back, these are the things that would be beneficial to share, or these are the things that you could say, or these are the things that maybe as a mother, they would like to hear because that's something I'm never gonna be able to ask. And that feedback is crucial because it's customized to that student. Not every student's the same. We have our strengths, we have our weaknesses, right? But it helps that student progress in what they need most. Seminary does not produce just professors or theologians, it produces priests. Priests go and encounter people. And it is one thing to say, okay, now you're ordained, now go start your ministry. No, you started your ministry while in the seminary. That's why this is very important for us in Mandalayan Seminary. It's taking us right back to the Gospels of Jesus saying, don't wait until I've risen from the dead to go out and try and share this message. Go out now, even before you have all the answers. That is critically a part uh, of this entire interaction and evangelization. This has given me more confidence that I'm growing in my ability to do ministry. This experience, I think, brings together the four pillars of formation perfectly. 